it's very easy for Satoshi not to you know get identified as he just won't engage he won't he won't talk with documentary field crews he won't come to conferences in person many people try to research you know look at all the emails look at all the forum posts and trying to deduce something from a digital footprint for 15 years and found nothing because people are fascinated about who Satoshi might be I think it's important for people who you know are involved in Bitcoin and understand the Bitcoin mission to talk to them because they will talk to somebody and you know if you don't talk to them you know maybe some influencer has got an altcoin he's about to release talks to them and then that will be you know a bad representation for Bitcoin. Peter obviously denies it and I believe him you know there are a number of reasons why you know people in the technical community would think it's not him. The sheer fact is that Satoshi stopped interacting on the forums in 2011 which is a really long time ago many people try to research you know look at all the emails look at all the forum posts and trying to deduce something from a digital footprint for 15 years and found nothing so we're probably never going to have any kind of digital proof and all that's left is you know kind of speculation about people who were interested in electronic cash before bitcoin or proof of work or participate in bitcoin development you know in the last like from the early days or more recently and of course, you can construct a kind of speculative pro and con for each person. And there are dozens of such people, right? So I think it's all speculation at this point. You're one of the first people that received an email from Satoshi. So, I mean, it's not that doesn't mean that you know who it is or you have a better idea of who it might be because you received direct correspondence with him. But it is very interesting that you are literally one of the people that interacted with Satoshi and all these years later... You actually don't care that much. And that's my next question is, does it even matter who Satoshi is at, at this stage if Bitcoin is running the way it does and it's becoming as mainstream as it's becoming? I mean, I think it's actually, you know, convenient or good for Bitcoin that it doesn't have, you know, an eccentric or strident founder type of person because I think the average person's intuition is to look for a leader of a project. And some projects do have you know, loud and vocal and maybe obnoxious or eccentric leaders. Like, you know, Elon Musk is a bit of an eccentric character with Tesla and now Twitter. And, you know, Linux system, which is a huge open source project, Linus Torvalds is a bit of a firebrand and, you know, swears at companies and has, a, you know, uh, aggressive views on different topics. Um, whereas Bitcoin, you know, I mean, it, its mission is more about being adopted as a, a kind of global fabric and electronic money and with no kind of founder type of figure involved it it helps it feel more like a discovery than a, a startup or an invention right so so i think that's good for the um the concept of bitcoin as a commodity it's very easy for satoshi not to you know get identified as he just won't engage you know he won't he won't talk with documentary field crews he won't come to conferences in person and i'm pretty you know fairly confident that it's nobody that's been talked about so it'll probably remain a mystery vitalik still remains like a kind of uh central cog to what ethereum has been doing and i think he tried to pull away in recent years and now he's he's become a bit more involved again kind of giving a bit of direction um is that is that a detriment to what they're doing, or do you think it matters that they have someone who's so involved and uh, so directional in in where that blockchain ecosystem should be going? It's impossible to kind of recreate Bitcoin because you know it bootstrapped from nothing organically when people didn't expect it to, and now there's an incentive for people who want to kind of imitate that. Um, to start a kind of pyramid scheme almost, right, where they will take some investor money, do some marketing, and sell the coins. And so, you know, that's one of the dramas that, you know, each of these kind of foundations, and they're almost like startups or companies, really. Um, and they have CEOs, they have a marketing department, etc. But they, you know, they're massively dumping coins on their early investors, and then people get disillusioned. And uh, you know, this... There, there was a period where there were 10,000 old coins and then 20,000. But apparently, you know, I wasn't tracking, but apparently, including the meme coins, there are now literally 3 million or something, right? There's so much kind of immediate 
like insider pre mines and aggressive dumping on on the retail speculators that the retail they all of the retail speculators lose money and then they get sick of it. I think Bitcoin is the only kind of digital asset that that makes sense as a, as a commodity that's plausible that could be adopted by serious investors. You know by um, you know, offered as an ETF or invested in by a sovereign wealth fund or, you know, mined by a country. And I think the mining is a necessary part of the hard money. Like, you need actual physical scarcity to properly kind of uh, sort of behave like gold in a sense. Well, you seem interested in allowing people to use Bitcoin to make payments. But at the same time, you've just said to me that it's it's fundamental value proposition is that it's you know uh, digital gold and it has hard money properties can it be both yeah i mean i think that you need both because effectively the fundamental value is the ability to save for the future which means spending in the future and it, and it's still having a value retaining value over the long term and of course bitcoin is volatile because it's undergoing an adoption phase you know eventually it should get fully adopted to the point where you know everybody who wants an allocation has got the allocation they want and then you get some kind of probably lower volatility people are thinking but at the same time <clears throat> you really need the two forms of spendability spendability as in you know ability to use your savings in the future and also spendability in terms of bitcoin's ability to be you know a very low barrier to entry global electronic money because there are many people in the world it's hard for us to lose track of it because we have reasonably good banking services debit cards credit cards and like mobile banking apps on smartphones and things but for much of the world they don't have uh, passports and identity papers to get a bank account if they did have they don't really trust the local banks in in some kind of unstable countries for good reason like they're not very trustable um and so it's difficult for them to participate in a global economy. You know, the introduction of Bitcoin in some of those countries, like El Salvador as an example, actually you know, allowed people to leapfrog from paper cash straight to you know, uh, sort of peer-to-peer electronic money without going through the, you know, the banking trusted intermediary phase. So I think you know, one target for Bitcoin adoption is you know as well as the growing usage as electronic money is for it to compete with gold and get somewhere near gold parity um and i think that's getting pretty close my theory which this is just a theory we'll see if it plays out is that you know if bitcoin starts to get closer to gold and that you know that becomes a story on the financial news networks that you might see you know an acceleration in the outflows from the gold ETFs into the Bitcoin ETF so that it could pull down and meet Bitcoin. So the parity actually becomes lower. Um, so that, that could accelerate it. US elections are coming up. Um, and as you said, we haven't quite reached the part of the bull market that you we spoke about in January of 2024. You've got Bitcoin ETFs and everything now. Um, do you anticipate a lot more upside in like uh, 2025, 2026? Uh, what are your general thoughts of of the election in that some of the more institutional larger investors that might want to you know join in the bitcoin market are waiting for the election uncertainty to pass so that you know whatever the outcome that that would uh, you know get that uncertainty behind them so then they could make the investment so some anticipation of that yeah so i think you just need a catalyst now to to get people started i think there is some positive reflexivity because if the price is higher the people doing mining don't need to sell as big a proportion to cover their power costs, so that immediately takes some selling pressure away once the price is higher. The other positive thing we've seen is that the the ETF buyers, which are not that big a percentage of the market, but they are sticky. They don't, you know, they don't panic sell, and I think that's because, you know, somebody with a portfolio, they're not, you know, day trading. They're calling their broker, they're making a decision, and they leave it there for you know they make an allocation they make a decision and they leave it there for uh, three years plus or something right so i think that we didn't know beforehand how they would behave but they seem to be you know long-term holders which is you know good for the market structure yeah so i i would expect to see a lot higher like it's still early in this cycle if you look at it compared to you know percentage movement from the market bottom on on previous cycles um 
And there are new entities who are, you know, buying lots of Bitcoin, right? I mean, MicroStrategy, doing lots of convertible notes at the market. And they are probably, if they had approval for $2 billion, uh, at the market selling. They sold and announced $1.1 billion last month. They have another $900 million to go. And based on the rate they were selling in the market and buying Bitcoin, it's about $40 million a day for the first part. Tether has said that they are, you know, they have a very good profit margin from the interest in all the treasuries you know 110 billion of other people's money so they're using a, a reasonable proportion of that retained profit to buy bitcoin for their not for tether but for like the company cash reserves and treasury and then we get some catalysts so i think the next catalyst could be that some of the bankruptcies are gearing up to pay out yeah. now so the mount gox one started People worried that that would result in selling, but it doesn't seem to have. I think people just cold stored the you know 20% of coins they got back. And it, and then the FTX is coming, and that's all cash, right? So they will be paying out $16 billion, which is a lot of money in Bitcoin terms, right? You know, the, those one or two billion selling sprees over a few weeks were moving the market. So, you know, if $16 billion comes back to uh, Bitcoin market and crypto market investors... Now, we don't know exactly how they're going to react, but presumably some of that will come back and buy back coins. Now, they'll be disappointed, obviously, because FTX, FTX bankruptcy like super ill-advisedly sold them in a bear market and pushed the price down. And now they're forced to buy back and push the price up. But, you know, they might prefer to be back in the market to them being out of the market because then you miss out, you know, on the next cycle, right? Adam Back, thanks so much for your time. Uh, it's really great to pick your brain on all things Bitcoin. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. It's a good, good conversation. Thank you.